I was a half hour into my third flight today. At least, this one was almost over. It started 14 hours ago, flying from DC to Cape Town. There, I caught a flight to Novo Air Base in the Antarctic. We were now flying west along the Mule Kaufman Mountains to a small camp set up by the US military. There was a recent discovery, and as a frequent business associate, I was called in to consult. I was briefed quickly, a flood of information compacted down. A World War II base had been discovered, hidden in a deep valley under a mountain. It had the name Festung 212 carved into the rock above the entrance. Festung was German for fortress. No question who it belonged to. There was said to be a massive weapons cache, and he wanted high level opinions on them. So I had to praise and categorize, perhaps reverse engineer certain tech if it somehow surpassed ours. Or it was a theoretical consult, date one theories of types of weapons the Germans could have below if they hadn't already investigated. I'm guessing the types of weaponry the Germans would have is kind of like guessing what type of ammo a school shooter is going to use. It's limited, but varied. We basically know the limits of their tech, because we faced it in battle. But that was the thing with the Nazis. They experimented. I'd studied Nazi warfare and the different categories of weaponry they used. I had also studied how they had been attempting to harness black magic to blend with modern technology. They weren't anchored down by morals or ethics, right or wrong, good or evil. In their eyes, they were the good, and they were destroying the evil. I had read Hitler sent out massive exploration parties to various parts of the globe, searching for mythical artifacts, lost civilizations, advanced or abandoned, anything that could give the crowds answers or an edge in warfare. We were lucky, they hadn't discovered anything. As far as we knew. I'm what you would call a weapons engineer. I won't go into my education, but it's extensive and involves engineering and biotech. I was poached young, groomed, and built up to create psyops and mass casualty military tech. I started a private firm called String Control. We did an advertise online. We designed ways to destabilize nations for private corporations and equity firms. We used a variety of methods, from social, to technological, to pharmaceutical, to political, to two million other tactics we had up our sleeves. Our previous contract was with a Southeast Asian country, trying to invade and take over another country without using any physical force. We looked into the target country, and found three quarters of its economy was based on agriculture. So we simply needed to control the weather. This might seem like a conspiracy theory idea. But it's real science. The Saudi Arabians have been adapting it for years. It's referred to as cloud seeding and uses drones to force precipitation with electric charges. There's other ways of doing this, like adding substances through chemtrails, such as silver iodide to existing clouds to induce rain, or even snow. But with flooding, the news of the disaster would enter the national stage and other countries would send help. We had to avoid that, so we designed a system of drones to perform the opposite. For two months, the target country didn't receive a drop of rain. Their economy crumbled as no one could grow or sell or eat. The target government caved and agreed to all terms. After the target had signed on the dotted lines, our employer paid us to flash flood the country for two days anyways, just out of spite. It was disgusting certainly. But I figured I'd be getting hired by another country to take this one out soon enough. And I looked forward to that day. I also had a lexicon of contacts for old World War II weapons and paraphernalia, buyers and collectors, and not the ones you'd find in the yellow pages. But this felt bigger than that. This felt secretive on a dangerous level. I thought back to the Germans. I wondered what type of weapons they were working on. How advanced they were for their time. It wasn't just the artillery I was interested in seeing. I was hoping to take a look at some of their labs. I was fascinated with their experiments. What was he working on next though? Genes? Gases? 
Viruses? What a horrible man he was. They all were. I sat back, exhausted. It wasn't just the flight or the time changes. I was burned out with work and have been planning to walk away for some time. My conscience was starting to catch up to me. Something I thought had shrunken down to the subatomic level and buried in that. I thought about some of the horrible things I'd been hired to do in the past. My mind was regurgitating it all more lately. Like I was in confession with myself. One of my first contracts was with pharmaceutical companies, lacing dormant but aggressive strains of meningitis and vitamin shots. We were given a carte blanche by the observing medical bodies because they had a meningitis treatment regimen nearing release. So we played a little god. We tested other illnesses and diseases and made some frightening discoveries. If you give a certain percentage of the population a debilitating illness, it becomes genetic. If they have kids, they get it and pass it on too. There's a reason you see it a lot more today than in the past. It's not just because the population has grown. Then I moved on to pediatrics. But I won't get into that. That's what causes me the most nightmares. The snow and cold hit me in the face the second the airplane opened and I stepped out, even with a thick, multi clavering scarf. This was a different kind of chill. My shoulders shut up, touching my ears. We were directed to a series of snowmobiles that took us to another, even smaller camp. There, we were given snowshoes and had to hack to the rocky summit of the Mule Kaufman Mountain a few hundred meters away. I could see a muted orange glow coming from what appeared to be a large doorway at the end of the footpath we were following. It wasn't a door. It was an entrance, carved into the rock. It led into a tunnel, lined with mining lights. We followed our guides as the path curved and widened and took us deeper under the mountain. Our guides began taking off their gloves, hats and jackets. What were they doing? Wouldn't it be getting colder the deeper we went? I passed several explosive charges attached to support beams throughout the tunnel. The explosives looked old and had German writing on them. Our guides informed us they were connected to other explosive charges set up at strategic points throughout the mountain to collapse it in on itself if needed. Why would that be needed? Our path curved ahead and I felt warmth on my face and found ourselves in a massive open cave. What the fuck was I looking at? The cave was lit by pot lights pointed up. They sent frightening, jagged shadows up the walls to the stalactites hanging down. But I saw green. So much green. This far north, all you see is white and gray, but this resembles something closer to a botanical garden. There was luscious vegetation and a pond. The long stalactites hanging from the roof of the cave were covered in foliage. Our guide saw my shocked face and told me we were in a geothermal pocket. The mountain was lined with them and they were rich in vitamins and minerals, so they sustained multiple types of hot springs and plant life, even without photosynthesis. But the greenery wasn't what held my attention any longer. At the far end of the overwhelming cave, a gargantuan, ancient statue of a bearded, Herculean-like hero keeping evil at bay was carved into the rock. The statue's hand was pressing what appeared to be a large creature set into the ground. It was like a hawk, but with teeth. Or... A dragon? The longer I stared at the statue, the more the word God seemed the only fitting way to describe it. In front of the statue, a small portable had been set up. That's where we were headed. Our guide told me to follow him and his steps specifically as we moved through the flora. I stopped and touched one of the plants. I hadn't seen anything like it before. 
it had multiple veins of varying colors running through it. There were half a dozen scientists and military personnel sprinkled throughout the cave, some with metal detectors. Oh shit, they were looking for landmines. I followed our guide's footsteps perfectly. We entered the portable. Inside, there was a large freight elevator, a mix of old German technology and our updated modern type. Lieutenant Colonel Sullivan stood by it, ready to debrief us. But first, he recommended we stick to the approved paths and hallways. The Germans had left booby traps. In the first two days of discovery, five scientists and three soldiers had died from a variety of old tripwires and nail bombs. It had been messy, but they believed it was safe now. Great. Stick to the paths and hallways. Sullivan moved on. The elevator was, in fact, built by the Germans, but the military believed the hole they went into had been discovered by them, not formed. The hole dropped 13 kilometers, straight down into the earth. At the depth of 4 kilometers, there was an elevator switch over, which dropped another 5 kilometers. There, an additional elevator switch over was needed for the final 4 kilometers to reach the hole's depth of 13 clicks. The elevator was the only way up or down, though there was a second tunnel up that ran parallel to the first switch, but it looked to be dug up by the Germans as a backup route. It appeared they hadn't moved on to dig any for the next two levels, at least from what had been found. This pathway was located just to the side of the elevator platform at the first switch over. It was said to take between four to five hours to climb to the surface in a very cramped and slanted crawl space. We were given heat repellent suits and instructed to stay inside the compounds at all times upon reaching the bottom level, which was where we were headed. How the hell was there a naturally formed hole that went this deep? Maybe the Germans really had discovered something. As we wrote down, my first thought was this was being used as a massive missile silo. 13 kilometers down though, what kind of tech did they really have? Or worse? Find. What if they discovered a new type of energy source? Something that dwarfed enriched uranium in fission capability and output. It reminded me of the most dangerous weapon I'd ever heard of. That was, thankfully, never used. The weapon was part of Project Pluto, the nuclear R&D division of the US military, and was referred to as SLAM, as in supersonic low altitude missile. It was massive, and in order to reach ramjet speed, would need to be launched by conventional rocket boosters from the ground. After reaching cruising altitude in unpopulated areas near the target, the nuclear core would be critical. It would then have an unlimited range from its energy source and cruise in circles until it was ordered down to the deck. That meant the SLAM, which would be carrying a mass payload of nuclear weapons, would turn the cruise missile into an unmanned bomber and deliver all of its warhead to the targets in an unwavering storm. But it didn't end there. After the payload was delivered, the missile could then spend weeks flying over nearby populated areas at low altitudes and cause massive shockwaves and deadly radiation that would destroy entire cities. If and when the missile went down, it would spew deadly radiation for hundreds of years to the surrounding areas. Someone had actually thought of using this. There was no way the Germans had gone that far though. We changed over to the next elevator, which was located on the platform directly below us. The hole was said to be perfectly straight, going down through earth, ice, rock and granite. As we rode the second elevator down, I watched the passing walls. There weren't digging or claw marks or anything. This really was naturally formed. We changed over to the third and final elevator. I started to think about what the hole had been used for. Sacrifice? It might be naturally formed somehow, but the statue in front of it was carved by men. It reflected us after all. I wonder if there were more statues where we were headed. There couldn't be. It'll be too hot without suits. Unless they 
whoever they were, had found a way. We arrived at the bottom of the hole, which opened to a large cavern with multiple German-built facilities inside. There was a large weapons cache and depot. The series of laboratories and multiple bunking dormitories spread through large, open caverns in the earth. Apparently, there were stockpiles of canned food and supplies to last decades down here. I couldn't believe I was here. I wasn't aware of anyone who had descended this far. Even now, 80 years later, I'd only heard of the Kola Super Deep in Russia in the 80s, reaching 12 clicks before it was shut down. Mysterious circumstances and subterranean sounds was the byline for the closure, if I recall. It had been drilled or dug through rock and granite and earth though. The cola had been strategically placed to take advantage of permafrost below the surface. Ice was far easier to drill through than rock and granite, and it had taken them years to dig. And this was deeper. We appeared to be in another geothermal pocket, but the plants were all purples and reds and oranges here. Steam rose from fissures in the ground like hydrothermal vents at the bottom of an ocean. I stared out the tiny windows of the compound, unbelieving the life that could survive down here, at this depth, with this heat. I was directed to the bunk rooms, where I'd be sleeping when and if I needed it. Sullivan then brought me to the weapons cache, where it had already been swept for booby traps. That made the crater in the pit of my stomach a bit smaller. I was still thinking about the eight men who died in the first two days. Naturally, I'd been wondering if the Nazis had used some kind of trigger and gear traps. I'd love to take a look at their handiwork. But we'd start with the nuclear arsenal. Apparently, the Uran project, which was the name of Germany's nuclear tech research, had not in fact harnessed nuclear. They had stockpiled hundreds of bombs though, the largest being the SE-2500s. Big fuckers. Looked like there was a few dozen of them down here. Then there were the various PCs and SPs, all measures of aerial bombs. But the scary thing about them was, they were all open. They'd been wired together and connected to what appeared to be some kind of kill switch. I was willing to guarantee they'd still detonate if triggered. What many don't know about the Germans' bombs were, about 10% of them never exploded. Men in fact would land and be buried under the rubble from other explosions going off. Namely in England during the Battle of Britain, the bombs could sit there, but others life for decades even being built on top of and not go off. But then, the slightest vibration just might. I'd been given two assistants, who I sent off to begin inspecting the arsenal, pre-diffusing. I just wanted time in here to myself, so I walked through the aisles, inspecting all the firearms, bombs and explosives that had never been used. I was eyeing the Mauser carabiners, the MP40s, the MG42s. It was all a pretty big letdown. These were all old weapons and nothing I wouldn't find in a high school textbook. It was all interesting, but what a disappointment. I picked up one of the Mausers, pulled back the bolt and checked it. Loaded, ready to be fired. I put it back down in the pile of other rifles but caused them to shift and fall. The whole pile tumbled behind the shelf, knocking a wall panel loose. Sullivan rushed over and found me putting the rifles back onto the shelf. I told him everything was fine and that I'd been clumsy. I went back to looking through the weapons shelves, but the wall panel stuck in my mind. There was something behind it. Sullivan and the assistants eventually called it a day. So. We packed up and went to the dormitory. I unpacked and laid in bed for an hour. All I could think about was the wall panel. What was behind it? I had to know. I snuck out of the dorm and back to the weapons hall. I made my way through the aisles of 12 foot shelves and found the rifles. And there was the wall panel. I pushed it inward and found a small ramp that led to a tunnel under the floor. Fuck it, I got out my flashlight and crawled into the tunnel. There was just enough room to stand up and let back towards the elevator. 
but under it. I followed the path all the way to the end and saw the last thing I was expecting. There was a door, old wood, metal plate and handle. Expensive, classic, well crafted. Something you'd see in an upper class hotel, only abandoned and weathered by time and environment. I fought with myself to open it and decided to. If there was a booby trap, so be it. I wanted to know. It was a large room that looked like a combination of office and library. It was filled with Nazi paraphernalia and old German books and photographs. An oil canvas painting with Hitler hung from the wall. There was a wine rack, an old record player with a collection of vinyls. Was this to be Hitler's last stand? Did he just never make it here? I thought about cracking one of the hundred-year-old bottles of wine, but decided to avoid eating or drinking anything we didn't bring down with us. Maybe I sneak one back up though. I walked towards his desk, curious at what I'd find, but my foot cut something on the floor and I tripped. I regained my balance and checked what it was. There was a latch handle in the metal square that looked a lot like a trapdoor. It occurred to me then, we were right underneath the elevator. Oh my god, did the hole go deeper? I assumed we hit the bottom, but what if it kept going, and this trapdoor led to it? Curiosity took over, and I pulled at the latch, lifting the door. No explosions, no booby traps. There was a short metal staircase leading to a small viewing platform. I climbed down onto it and saw at the far end there was a black iron spiral staircase leading down further. Jesus, how much deeper did this go? I peered over and saw that the staircase didn't drop much further than about 10 feet. Below me was what looked like a large cement floor. It was smooth and encased the entire bottom of the tunnel going right to the edges of the wall. This was the bottom, I suppose. I had reached it, and I was standing somewhere only one of the most evil men in history had stood. But on the cement floor, there was a large, perfectly rectangular chunk of granite in the center. It reminded me of what you'd find on the lid of a sarcophagus, but far thicker. It stood about a meter off the ground. I descended the staircase keeping focus on the heat and any possible tripwires or explosives. But there weren't any. This place was bare. I stepped down onto the cement floor. It wasn't actually cement, but something similar. It looked naturally formed, like some kind of heat absorbing foam that had hardened over the ages. The granite lid was what looked most out of place. It was black unlike the grayish white foundation under it, and it looked to be over a ton. Why was it sitting perfectly symmetrical in the center of this odd basement? How'd they get it down here? Or was it always here? My mind kept pulling up the image of the lid of a tomb, and some ancient being waiting under it to be brought back. Which was silly, wasn't it? I approached it, my flashlight catching something on top of the lid. Carvings. They were words, chiseled into the granite. I inspected them, but couldn't make any out. They looked more like symbols from some dead language, or languages. But at the very center of the block, carved over the other nonsensical gibberish, was a phrase I recognized as a modern language. It was hacked into the rock in German. Hello, of Jachten. I had no idea what that meant, but took a mental image of it. Is this where he kept his final weapon? Below his final stand? I put my hand on the rock to test for heat, but found the mass shifted under my pressure. The lid moved a few inches from my touch. I applied more pressure, 
and found the rock was easier to move than a piece of paper. Curious, I decided to shift it further. The lid slid away from me, a loud crack coming from under it, like rock breaking. What was revealed under the lid was something I could only describe as a world-changing event. There was a body in a coffin-shaped drop floor. Under the body, rock was cracking and crumbling away, as if cued by the lid opening. The body was a man and was wearing a 1945 German Chancellor's uniform. He held a Luger in his right hand across his body and a copy of Mein Kampf in his left. He was old when he died, in its 80s it looked like, but well preserved. And there was no question who it was. He still had his stupid mustache and haircut, though it had great and during his elder years down here. My mind raced. Was it one of Hitler's doubles that supposedly committed suicide in Berlin? Or was this one of them? No, this was him. The second I saw his face, I knew it was him. This is no double. I needed to sit down. But the ground under Hitler's body cracked again, this time splintering and dropping away. Red lights from below began to seep up through the rock. The drop floor under him collapsed, and Hitler fell with it. Red light and heat burst through the opening, filling the tunnel. What was down there? I peered over the edge, down through the opening and saw something I never wanted. I saw fire, brimstone, and writhing masses of body clawing at each other, waves of embers spraying down on them. I saw erupting volcanoes spewing out more screaming bodies as they were scorched by flames. The fire moved like a living organism, lashing at the bare backs and chests. I saw faceless people burning in vast lakes of boiling water, while large winged creatures picked at them from the skies. Miles and miles of it. It was endless. I saw a being in the far, far distance. It stood amidst the erupting volcanoes, taller than any building, whose head disappeared in the dark red clouds above. A sound emerged from it, shaking the bodies and creatures down below. The glass on my protective mask cracked, as if on cue from the being. The bodies and creatures turned their attention up towards me in the opening. They started rushing up towards me, clawing, pulling, anything to get away from the fire and pain. Another wave of heat hit me. It was immediately unbearable, but I couldn't move. My whole body went full rigor mortis. I stared down, my mask melting away into the depths of hell. And it stared back up. I got movement back, grabbed the granite lid and tried to slide it over the opening, but it wouldn't budge. I got behind it with all my weight, but nothing. It was too heavy now. I looked back down and saw the winged creature flying up towards the opening. The charred bodies of forgotten people were piling on top of each other, creating a mountain of flesh crawling and gnawing and mashing over one another to reach me on the way out. I saw Hitler, skinless and on fire amongst them. I tried to push the lid again, but it was solid and unmoving. It was open now, and it wasn't closing. I rushed back up the staircase, red light and heat filling the chamber. I darted through the tunnel, climbed out of the wall panel, and out into the weapons hall. I had to get out, I had to get to the elevator. No time to get my shit, no time to warn anyone, there was no time for anything. I had to get up, and I had to collapse the tunnel from the top. But I had to get out first. As I turned out of the hallway, I saw Ash and Cinder filling the armory behind me. It was coming. I rushed out to the one elevator and saw Sullivan just coming out of the dormitories. He looked confused, like he'd just woken up. His eyes went white when he saw the flames starting to fill the compound. I didn't have time to wait for him or anyone. 
I shut the gate and punched the elevator up at full blast. We lurched upward and pulled away. I watched Sullivan burst into flames as crowds of burning bodies poured into the hallway, piling onto him. The elevator moved fast. The fire was still down on the bottom level, but was slowly climbing the elevator shaft. I was going to be on this one until the next switch, which would take 10 minutes. I just hoped I would make it and the metal framing for the elevator would hold out. We made it to the next switch. I moved fast, up through the platforms and onto the second last elevator. This would bring me up to 4 kilometers from the surface, assuming I made it. As the elevator shot up the tunnel, I watched the platform I had just been on collapsing into the engulfing flames. Screams echoed up from the ever-growing cloud of fire that filled the tunnel with a reek of sulfur. Or, as it was previously called, brimstone. I got to the final switch and rushed up to the second platform. But the elevator to go up was gone. They had brought it up. Oh no, I was stuck here. I looked down and saw the fire rising up the elevator shaft. It couldn't be less than a few hundred yards away now. Then I remembered the second tunnel up. It'll be tight and four kilometers of cardio, but I would at least survive. That would take me hours to climb, and the fire would overwhelm the surface long before I got there. Unless I blew the tunnel. That was it. The explosives were on every level. I'd seen them on each switch. It hadn't just been through the mountain. The Germans had prepared for this exact situation. I rushed over to the edge of the tunnel. The heat waves rushing up, causing my suit to simmer. My arms burned, and I felt the plastic melting to my skin. I bit down and saw the controls for the tunnel's explosives. Everything was written in German, but operated similar to the mechanics of a kitchen timer. I quickly set it for one minute and rushed across the platform to the far side of the tunnel. I opened the large metal door to the footpath up and slammed the shut behind me. The footpath up was more like a spiral staircase, minus the stairs and very tight and low, like a twirling crawl space. I was essentially crawling upwards on all fours in an upwards right lean. My arms burned from the plastic, but I tried not to pay any attention to them. I felt the explosion go off, and the walls pressing my shoulders inwards shook. I waited for everything to collapse, to cave in on me. I waited for the heat to rise up behind, for the sulfur to fill my nostrils. I kept climbing, waiting for something to stop me. But it didn't. I had no idea how much further it was, or how far I had gone. What if somewhere up there it had collapsed? The thought of crawling back was terrifying. But if there wasn't anywhere to crawl back to, I'd have to take through it all, or just give up. The lower tunnel would have collapsed, and with any luck, the final stretch of the elevator shaft would have too. I'd know soon enough if they did. I climbed, pulling myself up, non-stop for what felt like hours. Time disappeared. Then, I smelt it, the sulfur. I turned back and caught the faint glow of red drifting up behind me. It was coming up the backup path. I scrambled faster, pulling myself up while the heat behind me got closer. The sulfur became overwhelming, and I saw embers dancing and jumping behind me. Voices screamed up from the flames, echoing around me. And then there was light up ahead. It was fluorescent, the kind the military used. I was almost there. I climbed out of the main cavern, exhausted. My body was drained and empty of energy, but I sprinted through the foliage to the main tunnel out. I got to the first explosive, turned back and saw the fire and bodies spilling out from the pathway. Sullivan was amongst them. He was just barely recognizable, charred to a crisp. He saw me, and a horrific screech bellowed from him. I cranked the timer to 20 seconds and sprinted through the pathway. 
My only hope was the explosives were still linked together and worked. As I burst out of the tunnel and into the freezing night, an earth-shattering series of explosions shook the ground beneath me and I was thrown across the frozen landscape by the shockwave. I landed on the snow, hard, but got up and kept running. I couldn't feel my arms or legs and had fallen into some kind of flow state of movement. I couldn't stop until I was back at the first camp and on my way to Novo Air Base. I wouldn't sleep until I was on a plane back stateside. I turned back and looked at the mountain I was just below. The mass of rock and granite splintered and had collapsed inward on itself. I hoped that would be enough. The first camp got me in a snowmobile and moved me to the airport. While waiting for my flight, I had my first moments of calm and began dissecting what had happened. The words carved into the lid, the ones I actually recognized as language, haunted me. Hello, of Yelten. I wrote the words out on a napkin, then looked up a translator on my phone. It was indeed German. And it translated to hell on earth. So that was it. That was his final weapon. Hitler was going to unleash eternal hell on the rest of us. Or was he? Had he, in his elder years, decided not to break the barrier? Had he found some kind of peace? Or did he leave himself there to be found someday, so that the discovery of his body could lead to this? And everyone would know who was responsible. I'm not sure I'll tell anyone, or I'll make something up. The tunnel became unstable and caved in. But what if I didn't stop it? I collapsed the mountain on it. I prayed that would be enough to bury it at all. But that granite lid, whatever it was, was what separated hell from earth. And it is gone now. I wonder how long it'll take to burn through the mountain and up into our world. <laughs>